Turn your Bibles to uh, Psalm, Psalm 8, verse 4. Psalm 8, verse 4. We'll start there in a minute. <clears throat> Psalm 8, verse 4. Now, before we, we begin, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever purchased something? Purchased something you thought was a great deal. You, you thought, okay, this, this is something that I have to have. It, it's a little bit expensive, but I know it's worth it. And then you get it home or it, it gets there and you unbox it. And as soon as you unbox it, you start noticing the flaws in it. You start noticing the problems within it. You start noticing how this thing isn't exactly what it was supposed to be. And even worse, it's not working properly. And you get this and you start having buyer's remorse right then and there. You start realizing, you know, was this really worth it? Is this really something that I should have bought? And you look at that and you say, you know, each and every one of us probably have, and I see through the faces, it, it, probably everybody has experienced this at one time or another. And if you have not, you're going to. But have you experienced this not in an item, but in your own work? In your own thoughts, in your own uh, thought of how you stack up in the way God or Christ sees you. In Psalm 8, where uh, I had you turn to, in Psalm 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 4, David goes ahead and he, he presents this specific question. And he says, what is man that, uh, that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You know, David is going ahead and he's, he's delivering this message, or he's saying this, and he's saying this directly to God, and he's asking God, essentially, why are you even bothering with us? Essentially, he's asking God, are we worth this? Are we worth it? Have we questioned our worth? Have you at one time or another questioned your worth to God or to Christ, even as a Christian? You know, I will be the first one to tell you as a young man growing up, as, as a, a young man that made lots of mistakes, and, and I'm talking about me right now. So just in case you didn't know, I'm, I'm still young. So, but you know, as, as one who makes mistakes, we all question our worth at times. We all start wondering, you know what, am I really worth anything? And, and uh, as I do something, as I go ahead and, and make problems, am I really worth it? And when we look throughout the throughout Christians, you know, a lot of times we might say, well, you know what, I, I, I just don't want to say that I'm worth it. Because, you know, I, I need to be humble in spirit. I need to make sure that I, I'm showing the due humility. I understand that, yeah, you know, the Lord loves me, but I'm not really worth it. And we don't want to profess that. And it's, it's easy to see why. I mean, when we look at different verses in the scriptures we can see like in Galatians chapter 6 verse 3 where Paul going ahead and he says if anyone thinks that he is something but he is nothing then he deceives himself or when we look at Romans chapter 3 verse 10 and 23 you know when it tells us you have some major flaws I have some major flaws and what are those major flaws that there is none righteous no not one and that each and every one of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. So when we look at ourselves, we understand that we are sin, sinful people that have, have come to Christ and we are sinners as we come to Christ and that he takes us in out of that sin and we, are, we were slaves of sin. He, we understand we couldn't do anything to get ourselves out of this. And then we come to Christ. And sadly, unfortunately, we all fall short again. We miss the mark again. And then we look at ourselves and we beat ourselves up as Paul did in, in Romans chapter seven. And we look at, Lord, am I really worth it? Do we start feeling the, the worthlessness of us? Do we start then going in and questioning, you know, maybe I am just worthless in the sight of God. Even when we go ahead and repent of our sins, as we know that God will forgive us of our sins, it can cause us to question. It can cause us to think and to have doubt. Well, tonight, I want to look at that. I want to look at my confidence in, in my value to God. Because the simple truth is, I think that we all face this. But you know what? If, if we have beyond or gone beyond that, I can tell you our children face this. 
I can tell you our teenagers face this. Our young adults face this. I would, I would venture to say that each and every Christian faces this at one time or another in their lives. But, you know, some may go ahead and look at this and say, well, you know what, but hold on a minute. You just said we're supposed to be humble in spirit. We're supposed to, we're supposed to do things the way that God... As a matter of fact, in Matthew, we see when he's talking about the characteristics that we see in, in the, those that are going to go into the kingdom. And in Matthew 5, he says, you know, you need to be poor spirit. You need to mourn. And we look at that and we say, well, so what's so bad about feeling like I, I don't have worth in God's eyes? I think there's a big problem with that. I think there's a big problem because we can swing from, from one pendulum to the next. I'm not saying that we should look at ourselves and say, God, aren't you thankful that you have me? But I think also swinging to the other extreme is just equally as damaging. Now, why is that? Let's, let's look at, before we go ahead and talk about how we can actually see our, our, just some, some ways to find our worth in Christ and God, before that, I want to just look at just three brief things on why not having that confidence, why not having confidence in God, uh, in, in our worth, what it can actually do to our psyche, what can it do to us as Christians. First of all, it, it makes us lose trust. It makes us lose our faith in God. How many times have we heard somebody say, you know what, I'm too far gone. God doesn't want me. I've just sinned way too much in my life. I've heard people go ahead and say, you know what, if I walk through that, that door, I'll probably flame on before I get to the... Do you understand? We do that as Christians to ourselves. We also see the same exact thing. Sometimes we go ahead and question. If we question the fact that God even has any, any uh, or sees any value in us, then don't we also run the risk of going ahead and saying, well, he really can't fix me. He really can't help me beyond what I'm at. Or sometimes we might, it might stifle our ability to grow or endure. See, if I don't think that God show, uh, sees me as worth anything, if I'm worthless in God's eyes, then why move forward? Why even get stronger? Why even grow? Because I'm already worthless in his eye. So if I'm worthless, he's not, I'm not going to see or be more. Why bother continuing on? Or maybe it, it causes a lack of care. Anybody who has had anything in their life, if you purchase a vehicle and you, you go ahead and you love this vehicle because it's brand new and everything's beautiful in it, but then you look across the, the parking lot and you got that other vehicle. You know which vehicle I'm talking about. The vehicle that has headlight out and everything is stripped down and you walk in there and it doesn't even have seats. And you walk by that vehicle, and what do you do with your car? You park it far away from that car. Why? Because that person doesn't care if they ding it, they don't care. It's worth, it, 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 it's, it brings them point A to point B, but if something goes wrong, hey, it is what it is. Whereas your car, you, you place more trust, you, you place this worth and this value on it. If it gets a ding, you're there buffing it out, trying to get it all off. There's a huge difference between the two. We can start to experience self-loathing when we start understanding or we start believing that we have no worth in God's sight. We start looking at God and we say, you know what? God sees me as worthless. That means everybody else probably sees me as worthless too. And we can fall into that trap. So those are just some basic things, things that we might fall into because we do not have confidence in our value. So, okay. So how do we have confidence in our value? How can we achieve that? Well, there are some different things. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna bring out something that's a little odd, but just bear with me, okay? Uh, the first thing that we see in, in an auction gallery article, I went ahead and I looked at this auction gallery article, and it, it was entitled, What Makes an Item Valuable? And the writer identifies four specific points. He, he goes ahead and says there's four ways that we can tell the value of an item or how you can kind of estimate the value of an item. He says the first one is quality, the second one rarity, the third one um, uh, market appeal, and the third, uh, the last one a condition, the condition of the item. And 
when we look at how society examines or determines value, I quickly started noticing that, you know what, this actually applies to us and how we kind of gauge worth of each other or how we gauge our worth to the Lord. That sounds odd because we're talking about antiques and, and items, but it actually can translate to us spiritually. And although it sounds, like I said, a little bit weird, it sounds a, a little bit superficial, I, I ask you to bear with me as we go ahead and we see the correlation. So let's see the first one, quality. This article goes ahead and it says, okay, it, it, it gives a quote, quantity, or quality is timeless. And we use the same quote kind of where we say, you know, it's not the quality, or it's not the quantity, it's the quality, right? And we say that essentially the the better the 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 thing is the more valuable the time is and the, the the time that i'm sinking into the, the quality of my time that i'm giving that makes all the difference that makes more difference than how much i'm giving if it's just snippets or if it's just cheap well here this article goes ahead and it highlights that using fine materials and superior construction and complexity it easily commands more uh value Right? Because it's, it's made better. It, it has these specific qualities. It's anything that has these type of qualities, then it, it commands more money. At the same time, the maker or the brand of the thing also commands more money, just normally. I mean, we can see that just very simply. If, I mean, if I go ahead and I say, hey, if you're walking by a store and you, your spouse sees a bag and it's made at... Uh, let's say, uh, what is it, uh, Louis Vuitton. Or you see something that is a, uh, a gift from Tiffany's. When you look at those things, you might go ahead and you say, okay, that's going to be expensive. Or when you get a car and you're going to go ahead and shop for a car and you're, you're uh, you know, young man uh, that you have your son, he wants to go ahead and get a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. You know, when you look at these things, you automatically, I, I didn't even tell you, I didn't show any pictures, but you know exactly what those are. Why? Because we know those things are synonymous with good quality. We know that those things are also synonymous with uh, meticulous care and how they were made and how they were manufactured. And it just, it gives you the stamp of value. Okay? It's worth something. But what if I told you, you know what, we're going to go ahead and get a Ford Pinto. Now, some of you are probably like, what is a Ford Pinto? Older people say, I know exactly what a Ford Pinto is, and I don't ever want to get into that death trap. Okay, so, or some may also go ahead and say, you know what, how about we just shop at Walmart? Now, Walmart's not bad, but it's not Tiffany's, is it? There's a huge difference between the two, isn't there? It's not that they're bad, it's that the quality is different. But how does this apply to us? How does this even apply to us spiritually? Well, the first thing is, brother, we, we can take confidence in the fact that our creator has fashioned us with the craftsmanship that is beyond anything that has ever been imagined. He has fashioned us better than anything in this world and anything that will ever be made. See, when we look at how the psalmist puts it, Psalm uh, 139 Psalm in, in verses 13 and 14. David going ahead and talking about this. He goes ahead and he says this. He says, For you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Those are beautiful words. And when we look at this, I love the way David puts this. And this, this last portion here in verse 15, you know, we don't use skillfully wrought very much. But that means embroidered. It means woven. And it gives you the impression of God going ahead and actually developing you, developing me, embroidering us, going ahead and weaving us into existence. There's absolutely no comparison for the human body, the complexity that the human body has. As a matter of fact, I looked at one article 
this weird article, I, I, I ran into it, and it was from Science Care. I opened it up, I'm thinking, okay, some science thing it, it, it might deal with, and it was uh, advocating, advocating for trying to get cadavers, to, trying to get people to go ahead and give up their, once they die, to give up their bodies for science. So I was like, okay, I'm intrigued. So, so I, I looked at this, and it said that the human body, get this, contains 46 miles of nerves, another 60,000 miles of blood vessels. It has 100 billion, with a B, nerve cells in your brain alone. And they're all working in unison and in harmony. Everything that we have is intricately working together, not by chance, but by creation. And when we look at this and we say, this, this science article says specifically, it classified the human body as one of the most complex machines ever to be on the earth. Now it classifies it as a machine. This is human being. In Genesis chapter one, verses 26 and 27, God goes ahead and he, he has fashioned us. He's made us. And we know these verses well because, but you know, we think about, okay, God has made us the physical, physical being, but it's not just the physical nature that he has created. In Genesis chapter one, verses 26, we see that it is the soul that he has created as well. See, it tells us, then God said, let us make man in our own image. We are created and fashioned in the image of the Lord. That should go ahead and give us confidence that we are worth something because we are in his image. But he also goes on and not just says that you are fashioned in that way, but he also gave man superiority over other things. In verse 27, he's, or in verse, the latter person of 26, it says that not only did he create them in our likeness and let them rule over the fish and the seas and over the birds and the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over all creeping things. Notice that man is unique in God's eyes. He's different from everything else. He is made superior above all of the creation and he is put to rule that creation. Now, in addition to going ahead and understanding, okay, we have quality, we've, we've got that one down. What else do we have? According to this article, the next one is rarity. Rarity and demand. You see, it talks about the rarity of an item or the scarcity of an item. If an item is not there, if, 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 if the item is in mass produced, if it's just one of, of many, then it's not very valuable. But if it's one of one, it's a whole lot more valuable. At the same time, it also talked about market appeal. That's just meaning a demand for that, that thing. An interest. So when we look at this and we see what society says, okay, this should be valuable, we also understand that if there is higher demand and less supply, then that commands more value, right? Basic economics, supply and demand. How does that apply to us? Well, when we look at how God has made us, the simple truth is each and every one of us, we're all human beings, but we are all unique. We're all different. We are individuals that have been made wonderfully, but we're all different. And here where we see that there is only one of you out there and there is only one of me. The simple truth is we are also precious in God's eyes. You see, in John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse uh, 1, John tells us that our Father loves us. He has bestowed on us this love and he calls us his children. That is the precious nature, the precious relationship that a Christian has with his Father. That is the unique relationship that we have. Now, sadly, Satan and those that have gone ahead and, and accepted the foolishness of the wisdom of the world has pushed a notion about us. See, the notion that has been pushed is that we were made by chance. 
that there was just no difference between us and animals, that, that we are really not worth anything. You're not very unique. You're just another person. And the truth is, if you don't have money or position or power, guess what? You have no value. But that is not what we find in the scriptures at all. But you know what's, what's worse than that position? What's worse than that position is that Christians fall into that position. Christians start to go ahead and buy into this type of thinking. What do I mean by that? Well, how many times do we go ahead and we look at uh, just the family household? And we see that the husband is successful outside in the, the business world, has a great job, doing awesome, but is not a very solid Christian. But we would classify him as a successful man. Or how about a mother? A lot of times we look at the mother in the household, society does not place value on a mother that's in the household but not working. God says that that is a wonderful blessing, that that is a worthy woman. And yet, sometimes we as Christians look at that and say, I'm just not, I'm not meeting it. I'm not cutting it. I need to have more. Or how about our children? We are raising our children and we are pushing all kinds of different things on them to, hey, you need to be, you need to be prepared. You need to be ready. You need to be successful. Everything's good. But how much scripture are we teaching? Are we helping them to grow in the admonition of the Lord and be that successful Christian, not the successful person in society? You see, that's the type of thinking that starts to go ahead and take over if we allow it to. Now, there's nothing wrong with going ahead and being successful, and there's nothing wrong for, with going ahead and trying to strive for success. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is exactly what Christ said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, where he says, for what does it profit a man? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What is the value? Is it the stuff or is it our soul? That's what gives us value. But you know what? We can even see this in churches. In some churches, we go ahead and we, we start to, to garner this type of mentality and we start realizing, you know what? Uh, I'm basing my worth off of what you do and what I can. And since I can't do it and you can, well, then I'm going to go ahead and move back because I'm just not worth the time. I just can't do that. Brethren, we're told specifically in Romans chapter 12, that each one of us is a part of the body. We are all members of the body and that we have all been fashioned and we have all have a talent. We are to use that talent. We're to go ahead and do anything and everything to go ahead and serve the Lord. So often we go ahead and we fall into this. But you know what? Even just on that sense, even just thinking about that, the other thing that we also see is that on, in addition to being rare, in addition to being uh, precious in the sight of God, we have to also understand we're in high demand. You go ahead and you say, what do you mean you're in high demand? We're in high demand. Well, what do I mean? Are you in high demand with your, with your family, friends? Absolutely, they love you, they care for you, they want you there, near them. But how about in the church? We just talked about that the church, each one of, our, uh, of us are members within the church, and that each member is important within the body so that it can function properly. But how about towards God? Do you go ahead and also have that same high demand for God? In 2nd uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 9, we're told that God is not slow about his judgment. He's not slow about the judgment. But he wants everyone to go ahead and be with him. He doesn't wish for anyone to perish, but instead wants all of us to repent, right? To come to repentance. But look at Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, and I'm just making sure that I got time. I, I, I want to look. I, I, I'm, I just want to make sure. It, it's 15 till, right? That's, 
that's where I'm supposed to stop? I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> Ten tail. Okay, well, uh, I'm just, I'm going to make sure that I, I get you out here before the sun sets. <laughs> no, no. In Luke chapter 15, verse 10, uh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 15, verses 7 through 10, here we have Christ going ahead and giving a, giving a, a set of parables. And the first parable, before, right before this, he gives the parable of the lost sheep. And he talks about how the, if one sheep is lost, then that person goes out to seek the 90, uh, leaves the 99 and seeks the one. And then he also talks about the lost coin and how that woman searches for that one silver coin that she has lost and she rejoices when she finds that coin. What is he talking about? The whole point of these parables is talking about a person that is lost. A person, a Christian that is no longer following and then comes back. And what does he say in verse 7? I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over the sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people, uh, righteous persons who need no repentance. And in verse 10, in the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels over God, over one sinner who repents. Here we see how precious a soul is to the Lord, where he rejoices and the angels rejoice when a person comes back to him. But you know what? It's not only, only God that rejoices and our family that rejoices. It's not only them who, who have us in high demand. You know what? Satan also has us in high demand too. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, right? Seeking whom to devour. He's looking for us. He's searching for us. He wants us. He wants to destroy us. A little bit different than a lot different than God. But the simple fact is, here we see even Satan wants us. As a matter of fact, we see in the case of Job, does Satan want Job? Well, he wants him to fail. How about Peter? Remember what Christ said about Peter? He says in, uh, to Peter that Satan has demanded to what? To sift you. Satan wants us. He wants to take us away from God. So are we in high demand? Absolutely, we are. So now we look at, okay, we've got quality. We've got high demand. We have rarity. I know I'm not going backwards, brethren. Don't worry. <laughs> and then we also have, when we combine those two, when we look at that, then society says that we should then have a good, solid value on whatever we're going to purchase. And I'm reminded that even though we look at that and we say that, do we understand that there was a solid price put on us? Do we understand that that price was paid for us? You see, in Christ goes ahead and, and tells us in Mar, uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, he gives us another parable. And this parable is talking about the hidden treasure. Again, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 to 46, we're reminded about the parable of the kingdom. And now here, this is talking about a specific king, uh, the, the importance or the value of the kingdom. But he goes ahead and he refers to this man that finds the hidden treasure in the field and he digs up the, uh, the treasure and he finds it, he puts it back inside the ground and he goes and he purchases the field so that he can have that treasure. And then the very next one talks about the pearl and how, okay, he, this person, this merchant, finds a pearl and it is worth everything. He goes ahead and sinks all his funds into that one pearl, to just to acquire that one pearl. And it's talking about the value of the kingdom. But I want you to understand, that's the type of value we're talking about in each of us as well. You see, when we look at that and we say, well, well how, how, is that, how is that even comparable? What was the price that was paid for us? It wasn't a pearl. It wasn't treasures in this world. It was the blood of Christ. It was the Son of the Most High. That's what the price was for each and every one of us. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we're told that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's what the price was for you and I. But at the same time, we're told that we were bought with a price. Remember, Paul goes ahead and says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Well, what was that price? That price was Christ. That, cri that Christ gave his life. He came and he died and he bled for you and for me. 
But okay, we look at that and we understand that. And then we come to the next thing. See, we look at all of this and we say, okay, well that, I've, I've met the quality. I've met the rarity. I met the demand. I have a value because the price has been set. Now I want you to, to remember, I said there were four things, right? What did I say were the four things? I said quality, I said rarity, I said the, the demand, there was condition. The condition of whatever that was. See, when, we, when I looked at that article, it said, you know what, you can have all of those, but if your condition, the condition of whatever it is, is no good, then the price drops. Just as in the beginning when I talked about you opened up that box and the condition was not what you expected. The price, the value drops. What is our condition? When we came to Christ, what was our condition? I told you in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 23, every one of us is in sin. Our condition is filth. Our condition is in sin. Our condition was that we were enemies of God. And yet, there was something that changed everything. Now I want you to go ahead and go with me to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10, here Paul going ahead, and he is, he is talking about uh, that there is a resurrection. He's, he's refuting the fact that people do not believe in, uh, that there is a resurrection. And he goes in, in verses 9 and 10, and he says this. He says, okay, Christ has appeared to all these people, and he says, For I am the least of the apostles, apostles not fit to be called the apostles, because I have persecuted the church of God. Or, uh, and he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Paul acknowledged the fact that by man's standard, Paul as a Christian would not be seen as the cream of the crop. He wouldn't have been seen as valuable, but you know what? He says, it wasn't man's standard that he was going off of. He says that God's grace found value within him. It was God's grace that made the difference. And guess what? It's the same thing that we see for us today. See, we are all rare. We are all in demand. We all have the willingness or the willing purchaser for us that has already paid our debt. And despite this, despite all of that, the simple fact is, we are still flawed. We still will sin. We still will fall short. We will still have problems in our lives. And we will still have weaknesses. We will still have dings and dents. And we will still have those what were you thinking moments. And if we based everything off of those qualities and we said, what does society think of us? And they're the judge. Society would say you have no value at all. But the difference is, again, we're not looking at society. We're looking at God. Let's turn to the last, last uh, verse here. Last verse is Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 3 through 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 3 through 9. Because, brethren, we need to understand that this worth that is given to us is not based upon what I can do. It's not based upon what I did. It's not based upon my, my, my value from what you see or from what I think. It is based upon God's grace. We're told in Ephesians chapter 2, the latter portion of verse 3, it says, We too all formerly lived in lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together in, with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that at the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one will boast. 
our value is based upon God's mercy and upon God's grace. That doesn't release the person from having to accept Christ and accept the grace of God, but it does say that it isn't me that goes ahead and places value on me. It is God who has placed value. Because of his grace, he has found value in me and he uses me with that grace. When we look at this, the simple truth is, brethren, if I place my confidence in self or the worth of the things that I produce, I'm just following into the same problems that Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. I start to look at everything and guess what? All of it will vanish away and it is all vain. But if I put my trust and my faith in God, and I understand that he loves me and he sees me rare and that he fashioned me and that I'm his children and that yes, I am demanded. I am in high demand with him. He wants me with him. Then I can also understand that his loving grace is what saved me and allows me to have value in his eyes. I pray that this has been beneficial for you. As I went through this lesson myself, I tell you, it, it, it helped me tremendously. As I went through this, I was trying to go ahead and piece this together in, in a different fashion. And, and to me, it just, it just made sense. So I pray that it has to you. If, if it didn't, come talk to me later. <laughs> but um, again, I really appreciate everything. So here's the final question that I have for you. No, I'm not going back. <laughs> the final question is how confident, how confident are you in your value to God? Brethren, if you are one, if, if you are one that's amongst us that has not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, has not repented of your sins, has not gone ahead and confessed Him and then been baptized, well, baptized, <laughs> baptized for the remission of your sins. If you haven't responded in that way, I will tell you your confidence is misplaced. You need to go ahead and respond in the way that God has asked. But if you are one who has already accepted Christ and you look at your life and you notice, you know what? I'm not really meeting the muster. Yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm pretty dinged up. And yeah, I have a lot of flaws. The beautiful thing is the Lord still wants you. And the Lord still beckons for you to go ahead and change your life and walk with Him. Won't you do that? If you're one who is subject in any way to this invitation and you are in need of anything and we can help you, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.